So uh, I know lots of people have asked different questions throughout the day, but I'm just interested right now, who is really looking to maybe escape their job? I just see a show of hands. A few people, awesome, great. And who right now is perhaps looking to invest from a pension point of view, so build up a long-term wealth? A few people, excellent, thanks very much. So the intent of my talk, which is probably gonna be around 40, 45 minutes, is really to show you how HMOs as a strategy can effectively work for you if that's the strategy you want to do. Now HMOs, for those people that don't know it, stands for Houses and Multiple Occupation, which is effectively where we take a property and rather than rent it out to a single family, we rent it out by the individual room. And I'm going to demonstrate some of the cash flow projections in that and also how you can get into that market. Now, you can't hear me. You want me to talk louder? Okay, fair enough. So you want me to wander around the stage like a comedian? <laughs> I can, can do that, but it's not really my thing. Okay, cool. So, uh, a really great quote that I always like to start with is from a guy that some of you may know called Robert Kiyosaki. Who knows Robert Kiyosaki? See show fans, most people? So author of Rich Dad Poor Dad, and one of the things he says is about investing and the fact that investing isn't risky itself, but not being on control is risky. And this is the whole thing around, you know, why this event has been brought together today and why myself and other speakers are kind of taking you through the different strategies that can actually happen in property because we're at this kind of precarious point right now, uh, I think, generally speaking, where this is wider gap becoming between the rich and the poor, and the people in the middle, which is generally, you know, the kind of the middle class, the people that are trying to strive towards that next thing, have been left by the wayside. And if we look at lots of things that are going on from a government perspective, uh, not in a great situation from the perspective of property investors overall, if you do it the wrong way. So some of the things I'll talk to you today about are the ways in which we can do it the right way and some of the things that we should be considering. Uh, but this is really all about being in control and actually having a plan. And one of the things that we're really, really big on at World Success Alliance is having some kind of plan. Because even if you spend today and learn lots of different strategies and you decide actually property investing isn't for me, I hate it, don't ever mention it to me again, at least you then know that actually what are you going to do next? Are you going to look at Forex, you can look at trading, you can look at something different, but make some kind of decision. Because the worst thing you could do is spend all day with myself and the other people speaking and then do nothing. Okay? So just make a promise to yourself that at least by the end of the day, you'll make some kind of action. Okay? Are we all agree on that? Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So when everybody thinks about property investing, typically they have some kind of image which looks like this, right? And everyone's thinking, I'm going to get loads of properties, I'm going to live in the sun, it's all going to be lovely, I'm going to be sitting on my little laptop, tapping away on the beach, and all this money's going to come in, right? And yes, property can make you extremely wealthy, but at the same stage, for the most people, property investment on a day-to-day -day basis is slightly more mundane than that. And in fact, when I first got started a long time ago, one of the things that I was struggling with was this whole piece around the fact that what appears great on the outside isn't necessarily so great on the inside. So I was uh, back in 2000, 2001, working for a travel company. And from the outside, everyone really thought, well, you know, this guy seems to be doing really well. He's got a nice house, nice car, great wife, and he's traveling around the world all the time. But anybody done any traveling here? Like lots of traveling, see show of hands? Could you agree with me that once you've seen a hotel and once you've seen an airport, you've pretty much seen them all, right? It just gets so, so boring. And I was being sent by my company to jump into uh, situations where effectively I'd be going to say Cancun, which sounds fantastic, for two and a half days to sort out some crap that someone else had done and then flying back, which sounds great, but in essence it's actually really, really boring. And my day-to-day -day life mainly looks more like this. Now, this is a, an image of the head office of RCI, who I used to work for, who are the uh, timeshare exchange providers. And this is in Kettering, and believe you me, anyone that's been to Kettering, this is pretty much what it looks like most of the time. Dark, grey and miserable. And in fact, when you're in a kind of company environment, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you are, because you've said you wanted to escape your jobs, uh, you'll find that you're doing lots and lots of things for lots and lots of people, and not necessarily getting rewarded the way that you wish to. 
And I was in this similar situation where I was spending a lot of time traveling for the company. Uh, I built up a, a product line for them of around $20 million, which was a gross profit of about 40%. So it was very, very high. We had a great team. But in essence, when I looked at what I could be retiring on, say when I was 50 or 55, it was actually pretty poor. And for any of you that have a pension right now, and if you even look at your pension statement, you'll probably start crying because it's literally just ridiculous. So I thought, for me, there has to be something better than that. And for me, it was really about, well, what can I do to actually start developing my own income and start being my own boss, effectively? Uh, and there's lots of things that I looked at. I did look at stocks and shares and online trading and marketing and network marketing as well, building my own business. But the thing that kept coming up again and again and again, and Kiyosaki does talk about this a lot in Rich Dad Poor Dad, is the power of property and that whole power of leverage. Uh, and for me, it was really, really starting to come to a head when I started investigating this and I started doing research in it and I started putting a lot of time and effort into actually learning about property. But the thing is, have you ever been uh, really, really keen to do something? You spent lots of time and energy on it and then done nothing. Yeah, be honest. Yeah, lots of us have done it. And I was in a kind of similar situation uh, and it got to a head where effectively I'd done all this research, I kind of knew property really was a great vehicle, but I wasn't quite sure what the next steps to take. And I decided to go along to this event that had a very famous speaker at the time, which is this guy. Now, this guy is not very well known nowadays, but at the time, because the rich dad kind of brand, very, very famous, a guy called Dolph DeRuz, and he's a guy from New Zealand, and he very much focuses on creative uh, strategies which was something that I was very interested in because of the fact that I couldn't really figure out if I bought a property and I was making say £100 or £200 per month from it, how I could ever escape from my job. Because when you look at the amount of money you earn, and I'm sure if you're in London you're earning decent money, it kind of comes a little bit staggering. So I went to this event because this guy was going to teach basically really cool creative strategies. And guess what happened? He didn't turn up. So there's a bunch of people in the room, there's probably like 150 people, 200 people at this event, it's a big event, uh, and he didn't turn up, and there's a lot of very irate people. And effectively, nearly turned to a mini riot, managed to escape that bit, but then another guy stood up and started on about this whole concept about cash flow, and how most people were getting it wrong, and actually, was it better to look at splitting our house into individual units and making triple or even quadruple the money? And that, for me, really, started to come home in terms of, well, if I could do this, that would be great. This guy's obviously doing it, and he lived quite local to me at the time over at Milton Keynes, and he was being very successful at it. And for me, it was then really a catalyst to start to explore that in more detail, which is why I went into this strategy. Uh, the problem is, you get to this little moment, right, when you've learned all this, but you haven't taken any kind of action. And you kind of say, where's this effect when you see other people passing you by on the street? It's like, oh, I've bought a property, and oh, I've bought a property, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and you think, damn, I haven't done anything. So there comes a tipping point, and for some of you here today, you may not be at that tipping point yet. The tipping point, though, has got to be really powerful enough for you to actually want to move forward. And for me, it was when uh, a new boss joined, and let's be honest, show of hands here, anybody that really doesn't like their boss, I mean, you can be honest, I didn't like mine. No, but, so everyone in the room loves their boss. That's fantastic. Well, you must have great bosses. So the number one reason most people leave jobs is generally because of their boss. Uh, and this new guy arrived, and basically within about five seconds, I knew that this was not going to end well for either of us, because it was one of those kind of meetings. Uh, and that for me was the tipping point, because I thought, right, that's it, I've, I've literally got to get out now, because I ain't going to go anywhere with this bloke. Uh, and that's what I then started doing. But I also realized at the same time that really the property model, generally speaking, is just fundamentally flawed because of the fact that the whole ethos at the time, this is back in the noughties, was about basically free and easy cash. So literally, if you were a monkey in the noughties, you could get a mortgage, you could flip it the same day and probably make about £20,000 cash back and it was lovely. But the problem is the long game. And a lot of what we talk about with Success Alliance is the long game has got to be thinking about, well, what's going to happen in 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now? Because these types of properties, oh, something blue there, that didn't look good at the back. It's the projector. Fabulous. Anyhow, uh, you've got to think about, right now we're on an interest rate holiday. 
Lowest interest rates we've ever had, literally, in Western society. But they will go up, and at some point they'll go back up to the general 5% mark that they have been for the last 50 so years. So if you start to then stress test your... Is this actually safe being up here? Because this sounds like really scary to me. It's like, should I like have someone hold this for me or something? <laughs> So if you stress test your portfolio, and if you've got properties right now, do stress test them. What does it look like at 5%? And for a lot of people, it, it, it starts to just not make any sense at all. So hence why, for me, it was really about, well, if I could maybe generate a lot more money from, say, taking one property and renting out about the room, what would that look like? So the first property I bought was this one on the screen, which you can't see, but it looks great on my Mac, I have to say. Uh, and it's a really nice little property in... Uh, uh, an area, oh it's come up, an area uh, in the East North Hounds called Rushton, which uh, isn't a town that's particularly famous for anything to be honest, apart from Rushton Lakes, which is fabulous if you've ever been, but the traffic is a nightmare, so I would avoid it at the weekends, okay, just making that point. But anyhow, that's not what we're here for, we're here to talk about HMOs. So this property, basically end of plot development, uh, last one on the site, and the key thing about this is really about the cash flow, because if you look at the overall rent roll, it's 26.50 a month, which means you're making around £1,000 profit at 5% interest rates, I hasten to add. And obviously we are not at 5% interest rates right now. We are much lower than that. However, if you were to take that same property and rent it out to just say a single family, corporate let for instance, you're probably lucky to get £1,200 to £1,300 per month from that one property. And literally this property did not have very much done to it. This was really about fire doors and fire systems and other bits and pieces which we talk more about on some of our more advanced courses. But this is really just very little added to it, mainly furniture, and from that you're able to generate a great cash flow. So, I don't know if you've got pens and paper and such like right now, but if you were to just write down on your pen and paper right now, or even on your phone, what your monthly income is right now, and then just divide it by that number, for most of you in the audience it's probably going to be not that big a number. And this is the great thing about HMOs. You can actually just buy a couple of properties for some people. Some people may need five or six, and then you're done. That's pretty much it. So this property here really allowed me to start effectively buying more properties. Uh, this was around uh, 2003, 2004 when this happened. And because I'd seen that this one could basically uh, take place, that was the catalyst for me. And as I say, for some of you in the room, you may need that kind of tipping point to really push you over the line to think actually now is the time and now I've got to get on and do it. And any time is great to buy property, but you've got to have that reason why. And I'll come on to that in a minute in terms of why it's important. So that then basically allowed me to start generating income from this property. And then I was able to leave my job, which I was very happy about. And so was my boss, who got sacked recently. Very late, yeah, actually it was about three months after I left. So that was great too. Uh, but anyhow, I'm not bitter. Uh, so the whole piece around this is the acceleration. And once you have that tipping point, you really start to make that drive. And I think uh, Sarah talked about this as well early on in terms of uh, somebody that's seen that they can do it once, you can do it again, and you can repeat it over and over again. And then that allowed me to effectively build up a three and a half million pound portfolio in literally just under 18 months because I could see that this one worked and I just needed to buy as many as possible to then replace my income. And that kind of led on to a whole bunch of kind of different crazy things, which will probably come up here in a moment. Lots of lovely pictures and such like. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty about why we're really here, which is how to make cash, right? Uh, so, any of you uh, subscribe to Your Property Network? Anybody? Well, if you don't, you definitely should. It's a great magazine. So I was the original HMO mentor for uh, uh, Your Property Network. And that really enabled me to reach a much larger audience. But at the same time, it got me onto things such as BBC Working Lunch. Uh, also got me onto various radio shows on Radio 4 and also Radio 3. Uh, and just allowed me to start expanding upon what I'd learned and allowing others to benefit from that. So back in 05, 06, I started effectively showing people what we were doing and how to do it more effectively. And that's when your HMO Expert uh, was created, which is a website that's been running now for 12 years. And it's got so much information on HMOs on there that's all free that you can go and access uh, that you should definitely check out. So if we look at HMOs, why do HMOs make so much sense? 
So it's because of a couple of reasons really, uh, but you can do HMOs even if you don't have a lot of cash or time or resources. There are different ways in which you can do it and some of the people that have spoken today have talked about things such as rent to rent, we're going to hear about lease options later on. There are all different ways in which you can control property, but all of them can be used to basically build a HMO business, which is what we're all here to do uh, if you want to make the most amount of money. So quick audience participation. You won't know any of these properties, you don't know where they are, but I just want you to basically raise your hands for the property that you think is generally going to be the easiest to rent. You might like the look of it, you might think, mm, it looks like it's in a good location, and I know you don't know anything about these properties, but just bear with me. So, we've got three properties coming up on the screen. So, hands up for this one here, who thinks that one would be the easiest to rent out? Just see a show of hands? So, a couple of people. Awesome. And the one in the middle, who thinks that one? Thinks that one would be the easiest to rent out. A few more people. Brilliant. And the one at the far right. Okay. Brilliant. Awesome. And who is asleep? Anybody? No? Okay. Cool. So, interestingly enough, all of these have been the easiest to rent at different parts in their journey because the thing about property is it goes in cycles. So, this one on the left is in a major town centre. Uh, in Derbyshire and literally it's three minutes from the town centre and for a period of time that was very easy to rent because if you look at it it doesn't look much to the outside but next to it is Mr Pang's Chinese takeaway and next to that is an off license and next to that is a supermarket so for HMO tenants it's literally like heaven on earth literally but the thing about property cycles is they change over time so right now the one in the middle this one is the easiest one to rent out. Now why is that? Again, just because of changes in the market, changes in demand. That property is in an area called Rushton in East Northamptonshire, which to be honest is nothing special, apart from the fact that it currently has the largest out of town retail development in the UK being built. So that means more contractors, it means more people coming into the area, it means more people taking jobs, and thus it's a lot easier to rent out than the other properties. Now, the one on the right that a lot of people did vote for, interestingly enough, this is a great property. It's probably bigger than all of the properties, and you can only, you can only see a little bit of this. It's a Victorian property, huge rooms. However, it is behind a row of shops, and to get to it, you have to go down an alleyway. So for professionals, it is never going to work because guess what? Professionals like to see their cars. And if they can't see them, they don't want to rent from you. So this property is rented generally to key workers, uh, but you're never going to get as many people wanting to live there as others because you have to go down an alleyway. And even if you light it up so it's literally like, you know, really, really light and there's no dark bits in it, people still don't really like it as much as the other properties. But the key thing about this is, it's not necessarily about the amount of properties you own, but it's about what you do with them and how much you earn from them. And I'll show you some case studies in a minute in terms of the different types of amounts of money you can make from different properties. Okay, sound good? Are you still with me? Are you sure? All right, we'll carry on. Right, so the first place that we kind of start before anything else is really understanding this piece around purpose because if you get this wrong to begin with, then you can go basically down a rabbit hole in the wrong direction. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about our profits principles uh, that we use to develop portfolios in a moment. But this is the first piece for all of this, because this is more important than anything else. And this is how you will get through the dark days of property, because property is great, it makes a lot of money, but also you never know when a boiler is going to break. And sometimes boilers do break and sometimes they cost £2,000 to mend and you have to mend them. And I'm not trying to put anyone off here, I'm just telling you the truth. So the first place to start is very much around this whole piece around having some kind of vision. And this vision is kind of similar to uh, what Freddie was saying earlier, I guess, in terms of really changing your mindset and understanding what it is you want to do and where you want to get to. Because without that, you can set yourself a goal but if the goal is just something on a piece of paper, then it's not going to make anything for you. But if actually your vision is that, you know what, I love skiing and I want to go for three months of the year skiing and I want to do that in, say, Canada, then you have to set up a business that allows you to do that. Otherwise, you're never going to do this. The same thing about buying trinkets and houses and cars and all that kind of stuff. They're all great, but you need to have a vision behind you in order to do that. And that vision needs to be as exciting as possible in order to make you want to achieve it. Because if it's not, 
you'll just end up buying a few properties and then kind of losing interest or maybe even going into something else. Or lo and behold, the next shiny penny. There's lots of shiny pennies out there, which we're not going to talk about today, but there's plenty of websites I can recommend if you're interested in shiny pennies where you'll never make any money. So get your vision right and then choose a strategy. And this is the important piece. And uh, in this book here, uh, which I wrote in 2013, this is the third edition, this book basically goes into the 45 different strategies that you can do in property. Uh, and there are lots, and there's probably more actually that I didn't even talk about, but every strategy, you need a certain amount of cash. You need a certain amount of support. You need a certain amount of understanding about what your return on investment is. And you also need to have a certain level of experience. You know, it's not very easy for, say, someone that's new to, say, jump into care homes, but it is easier to do, say, flips and HMOs and things like that. So strategy is really, really important. And it's also important that you're focusing on no more than two. Because if you're trying to do more than two at a time, it is just not possible. You know, what do McDonald's do? Now, there's a question, by the way, you can answer. Anybody? They sell burgers. They don't sell perfume. They don't try to run a cosmetics range. They just sell burgers. Whatever you may think about them, they sell burgers. And obviously they are in around HMOs, but it's just HMOs. That's pretty much all we do. Now, HMOs can range from, say, a small five bed up to, say, a 20 bed that we're developing at the moment, but they're all certainly some type of HMO. Uh, the last piece that comes into that is then your financial freedom goal. And this is really important because without this, again, it's easy to create a vision, it's easy to have a strategy, but what if that strategy never gets you to that goal? And that original goal, the first one, because there's three or four stages of this, is really about allowing you not to have to work. If you don't want to, some people do. Uh, we have some clients that love their jobs and we just build portfolios for them. We have other clients that want to get out as soon as possible. So it's entirely up to you. But have that first goal in mind in terms of, well, if you need to make 3,000 or 4,000 pounds a month, or whatever it is, how are you going to get there? What strategy are you going to use in order to get there? because the strategy is very important as long as it's backed up by the vision and hence why this whole piece around purpose is so, so, so important. Make sense? Yep. Cool. So I want to tell you a story about the power of purpose and, and why it's really important uh, because without it, you can literally not achieve anything, but with it, you can achieve whatever you wish to achieve. So uh, back in, this would be in 09, uh, my business partner at the time went to see a property, which is this delightful one up here. And you can see it's in really good condition, and you could move into it tomorrow. However, to do that, you'd probably need about 50,000 minimum to maybe 110 to really get that up and running for any kind of uh, way of letting it out. And the reason why it was shut is because the investor decided to remove the fire alarm panel in front of the, of the HMO officer who is uh, an officer that runs around basically telling you what to do, and they do love that, and fire officers. So if you do that, generally it's a really bad thing to do, and they shut down the property. So this property you can see is vacant, and effectively he offered the property to us, and at the time we were looking at it thinking, well, we're going to spend at least 50k minimum, and that was really very bad kind of refurb, just in and out. Plus he wanted £1,900 a month mortgage paying, because that's what he was paying on this property. Been vacant for 18 months, uh, and it just didn't really make sense. So we said no at the time, but then about three weeks later, he called back. Now, this was around about, it was either 27th or 28th of December, uh, and I do remember it was around that time, it was just after Christmas, and you know, like in the UK, it never ever snows, right? Ever. I mean, they say it's snowing in London, it's like, it's just, it's not snowing, it's not like Bridget Jones' diary, it's just, you know, whatever. But this was actually snowing, and this guy rang me very early in the morning, about half eight-ish, and said, look, I've got 10 properties. I really just want to get rid of them because I don't want them anymore because I'm thinking about going overseas, and they're just too much hassle. So, what do you think I said? Yeah. Uh, anyone till there? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I said, yes, yes, that would be great. How do we go about this? So he said, well, come out and look at them. Uh, can you come out today? So I looked out the window, and as I said, this was one of those rare blizzards in East North Hans, which doesn't happen very often, where everything was covered, couldn't see the car, and I thought, well, okay, I need to go out and see these properties. So a journey that normally takes 22 minutes basically took over an hour, 
But the beautiful thing was, this guy had 10 properties. They're all in prime locations in Northampton. They're all HMOs. They're all very badly run. Uh, and he would literally go from door to door every week in his, at the time, brand new Mercedes SLK, collecting rent in cash, and wondered why he was having so much problems. Because he was missing people, people were out, lots of maintenance things going on, and we basically sat down in the pub around 12 o'clock and had a chat. He had three Jack Daniels, neat, uh, and decided to do the deal. Now, this was at the time when the whole concept of lease options was getting really, really big, and people were talking about this whole thing about, okay, you can buy property for a pound and then move on. I'm not going to go into all of that because I think Peter is talking about that later, right? Well, I hope you are. He says he was. So, listen to Peter's talk on lease options because he does loads of them. Anyhow, uh, lots of people were doing these, and my business partner and I at the time talked about, well, if you can do one, why don't you just do three or four at a time? Uh, so we effectively pitched this to this guy who had 10 properties and basically we ended up with 10 properties for £10 plus legals and as I said I'll let Peter go into the details of how he do all that uh, which enabled us to take over a £1.4 million portfolio they were all HMOs now the great thing about this and this is why it comes back to this whole thing about purpose and vision is our vision that we'd set out three months earlier was to build up a national HMO lettings agency effectively backed by either joint venture partners or portfolios so this first portfolio effectively allowed us to set up what is now our Northampton office, which I still have, and then to set up other offices. So we did one in Lincoln, uh, we took over £1.6 million worth of property there, uh, actually had a call from the guys in Northampton at the time saying, there's no fire alarms in these properties, and we said, we know, we're working on it, it said, get someone around now, so we did, and so on and so forth, but it allowed us to build up uh, basically a national lands agency. Uh, which uh, had at its peak 36 staff and in the first 12 months we hit just over £150,000 a month in terms of rental income uh, which is fantastic uh, but it also enabled us to open up five offices and then we won this Lettings Agent of the Year which is me pictured with Craig Phillips the original winner of the original Big Brother which is when it was interesting uh, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm just kind of sharing this story with you because this is all around purpose, vision, commitment and strategy. So our strategy was basically HMOs that we were either backed by rent to rent or lease options or purchasing. We didn't do anything else. So people talked to us about developments, talked to us about just buy to let, talked to us about doing uh, title splits. We didn't do any of that. We just did the one thing because we were very, very good at it. And a lot of this was also backed by our systems and uh, I remember on one day we put 118 units into the system which then the next day were all up and running, everything was basically where it needed to be, all tenants that needed chasing were in the system and you could carry on from there. But to do that you need to have that really clear vision surrounded by strategy and then make it happen. So let's uh, quickly look at private clients. So, um, I just mentioned this slide quickly because often when I speak uh, uh, in different audiences there's a few people in the room that think yeah I'm potentially interested in that and if you are you can come talk to me later but basically for private clients we generally do one of two things we have a build a portfolio for you which is generally in Northampton or Manchester currently and we're about to open up three new locations because we do this in conjunction with a bank or you can work with us where we'll help you to build up a portfolio but you do the work yourself. So you effectively will do it or you'll do it, entirely up to you. So those people might be interested in that, you can speak to me later about the details and it should be in your products and services brochure that we've handed out anyhow. Okay, so just quickly moving on. So this is really, really important. I do believe that anybody can achieve whatever you wish to achieve if you set your mind to it and you can also give back at the same time. And this really just comes down to mindset and mindset alone, so, so, so important. So I just want to show you now some examples of the kind of cash flow you can make from HMOs because if you believe it is possible, it is. And if you believe it isn't possible, it also isn't possible. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the profit principles that we go through effectively to build up HMO business uh, effectively take seven stages. The first one we've talked about is purpose and we've kind of looked at that. The next piece is then the whole portfolio, which we're not really going to look at today, but this is all around the sourcing element, and I kind of took this piece out because I know Sarah's going to be talking about sourcing. This is really about how you find the right deal and make sure that it is in the right area and also has the right demand, which is very important. 
The next piece is then profits. So we're going to look at profits now in terms of how much you can actually make from a HMO. So it's all about the cash flow. That's really what it comes down to. So as an example, if you take a property in the Midlands, generally worth about £200,000, which I know for you Londoners is just like impossible, but these properties do exist. They are up north. You've got to go past the Watford Gap and you will find them. Uh, for £200,000, you can get effectively a four bed uh, in the Midlands. Now, you have two choices. You can rent that out to a family or you can rent that out by the room. So if you rent it out to a family, effectively you're looking at a rent of about £1,000 per month. Uh, now, I'm not going to go through all of the various costings, but there's loads of costings on there, and everything is pretty much covered, but you're not left with a lot at the end of the day. I think it's 91, yeah, 91 pounds. So after all of your costs, again, based on 5% interest rate, all the things I'm going to show you are based on 5% interest rate, you're not left with very much at all. Now, if you were to then take that property, and you were to rent out all the four beds as individual rooms, and one of the reception rooms, you would probably be looking to achieve around £2,000 per month, and this would be for professionals. Now, the cash flow on this is significantly higher, £506 versus £91. And again, this is quite conservative in terms of these figures are always done in a way so it's muted, you can earn more than this. I always like to be realistic, and I'm going to show you some other examples in a minute which are actual real deals. But this is just to give you an example of just by changing what a property is and what you do with a property, you can basically effectively quadruple your profits. So hands up who would like a single let property on the left hand side. See a show of hands? No one at all, okay. What about the HMO side? Anyone like one on the right hand side? Absolutely, more people. And some people are definitely in the wrong room because you should have put your hands up there. That was, that was your cue, but it's cool. Now, uh, thing to point out here, uh, and this is very important, is this piece here where it says all of the bills. So. One thing you should take away about bills is effectively most HMO tenants pay an all-inclusive rent. And because of that, you as a landlord will be responsible for the bills. So gas, electric, water, council tax, etc. So when you're doing calculations, always include around £100 per month per tenant. Okay? So this is really important stuff. So if you're not writing it down, write it down. £100 per month per tenant. Because that is what it's going to cost you to run your HMO. Now, once you get above seven people, it's not going to go up in £100 increments. It's going to drop down slightly. And if it's below three, it's not going to be quite £100 per month because of the size of the property typically. But a free person HMO generally doesn't make any money, so I would not advise it. But important to have that in mind. So let's have a look at a few case studies. So this one is in Northampton, uh, 185. Uh, open market price. This is four shares in a flat and this is for effectively a key worker type market. So it's not aimed at the professional market uh, and there's five markets that you could aim at but this one's aimed somewhere in the middle. Uh, but the key things on here is again cash flow 822 a month. Uh, and this is in an area in Northampton that's very easily accessible for both students, key workers, uh, so you can literally rent to different uh, types of demographics if you wish to. Second one, uh, this is another one in Northampton. Uh, this is effectively one of our portfolio builder clients. So this property was undervalued when he bought it. Uh, 142, it was probably at the time about 160, 170 he should have bought it in terms of if you to actually buy it full price. But the key things here is the rent, 2640, bills are 600, mortgage is 737, which gives you a cash flow of 1302. It's a significant cash flow. Um, the reason why the mortgage amount looks so high as well, for those of you that are really good at doing figures in your head, is because that's based on a commercial mortgage. Uh, so the investor has effectively pulled out the majority of his cash on that deal. So he hasn't got anything left in that particular deal. If you divide the traditional way, that mortgage would be a lot less. But even so, £1,300 per month, who would like one of those? A few people? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next one is in Bury, which is an area that we invest in. This is just a standard Free bed doesn't look very nice to be honest, but very cheap, 105k. Uh, rents out at 17.50. I think this is a five bed. Cash flow at 8.40 a month. So this is all of your profits after everything has been paid for on this particular property. And again, on a 105,000 pound property, that's a really, really good cash flow. Uh, another case study. This one's in Northampton. Uh, this is a 280 uh, buy-in. Uh, six shares in this one. 
The rent on this does vary from around 2030 to 2550, sometimes 2600, but this does vary. Uh, you know, whenever you see uh, rent rolls coming through, they're always going to change slightly. It could depend on the time of the year, it could depend on if you've had, say, a void during, say, the December period and you just need to get someone in quickly so you drop the price. But you're generally going to have a rent roll that's within about 10% of that figure that's advertised. Now, this one here has got quite a few bills on it, 1332, but still the cash flow is 997. Now, the interesting piece around this is obviously when you look at the cash flow on this one versus the one behind, cash flows are quite similar, really. So if you the, buy a property that is, say, 100K, 150K less and still get the same cash flow, it's a really good business model to follow. And those opportunities do exist in the northern parts of the country, not in London, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, fifth case study, this again one is in Bury, uh, it's on the park, 130k, it's got six sharers, uh, 2200 rent, bills are 12.16 with cash flow of 984. Uh, and all of these are achievable uh, should you wish to go and invest in HMOs in those particular areas. Uh, this one is rented out uh, mainly to young professionals, uh, it's near an area of the town where you can get in to the city centre, it's on a tram line, uh, so it's very easy to get in and out. So, some great cash flows, uh, and that just shows you the kind of cash that you can create from these properties, versus, let's say, taking that same property and just renting it out as a single let. So, if you were to rent this property out as a single let, this would probably be about 750 to 850 a month maximum. Obviously, the bills would be significantly less. You're probably looking at maybe three or 400 pounds per month, but you wouldn't be making nothing near the kind of cash flows. So, cash flow, really important. Uh, and obviously the key thing around why HMOs work is because of the cash flow. So I know that early on we asked if anyone was investing in property right now and no one really put their hand up. But does anyone have any deals at the moment they've been looking at that they're struggling to make a decision on that they might need some help with? Yes, lady there. Say that again. Struggling to understand how it works. Yes. And my question does all property have to be self contained? All rooms okay. have to be self contained when you're doing a hedge Yeah. Okay, so the question was do all rooms need to be self contained? Uh, no, they don't. Uh, when you're saying self contained, I assume you're thinking about like a flat. So everything is in there. They have a kitchenette and a shower room, etc. So no, they don't. So what you'll find is in the HMO market, everybody you speak to wants an ensuite, like everybody. But not everybody wants to pay for an ensuite. It's just like going on an aeroplane, right? Everyone wants to fly first class, but not everyone wants to pay first class. So what you'll find is that the traditional uh, kind of sharer is probably going to share with two to three other people with a bathroom, up to a maximum of four people. Uh, they're typically going to share a living room and also a kitchen. Uh, and you know that is pretty much common across the UK. Now you can rent out rooms that do have kitchens and bathrooms included within them, but typically they have to be bigger. Uh, and a lot of these kind of terrace properties I've showed you wouldn't be big enough. Uh, so we'd always rent them out with say a living room and a kitchen. Uh, and effectively what you're aiming to do is essentially take that property and look at how you can basically generate more cash from it. And from our point of view in terms of units that we're trying to effectively add into the market, we're trying to double or triple the amount of units that are in the market. So if you look at right now what the government is trying to do, they're trying to build more houses. 300,000 houses we're told that we need. Uh, it's going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for them to get to those targets unless they do work with people, say, in the HMO sector to start looking at how we can develop more HMOs. Because every HMO that, say, we develop in Manchester uh, or Northampton is an additional six units minimum, typically, into that local area. Now, admittedly, they are a unit which is much smaller than, say, a one-bed flat, but not everybody wants to live in a one-bed flat. And this is one of the things that you should kind of be aware of in terms of getting into the sector is that Yes, people would love to probably live in a studio or one bed flat, but they can't necessarily afford to do it. They don't want to because they want the social aspect of living with other people. 
Plus also, it's really easy if you rent a room, costs you say 450, 500 pounds per month, all your bills are included. All they've got to worry about is basically Netflix subscription, mobile phone, and then whatever they spend on going out and getting drunk. Basically, that's kind of how it works. Uh, so, does that answer your question? Awesome. Cool, so uh, we're gonna have a quick look at Ken, who, as you can see, is very serious and doesn't like speaking on camera. Hence why I just took a picture of him, because truly his testimonial was awful. However, what he said was really interesting. So, Ken is uh, an IT contractor, or he was, and he had 24, 25 units, and these are all single lets. And this really illustrates the power of HMOs. So, he basically spent half the year working and half the year off, basically, any good money from IT, but then he spent half the money off. Now, as you can see, he's getting on in years a little bit. So he wanted to spend more time at home with the family. He also had some grandkids he wanted to spend more time on, but he couldn't do that with the current properties he had because they were single lets. So we basically worked with him uh, through some of our client work uh, on a, as a private client to look at how we can help him build up a portfolio. And this was done in a way where he started to buy a couple of properties a year, which were small HMOs, uh, about five beds, that were adding an additional 750 to 800 pounds per month into his pocket after all costs were paid. Now, the beautiful thing about what Ken had as well is, and for any of you uh, out there that do have properties, you should definitely look into this, is do you have a property right now that is, say, a free bed or more that could be turned into a HMO? because you could have basically hidden cash locked up in your property that you are not utilizing. Ken actually had five of these that were four beds that he bought about 15 years ago that were new builds, so they were still in pretty good condition, that he was renting out to single families. Now, by effectively working with him to tame these properties into five bed HMOs, we added an additional 155,000 pound a year rental income into his portfolio. And obviously not all of that is cost, uh, not, sorry, not all of that is profit, but the, the actual cash flow on that was significantly greater than 50K, just by doing that one simple thing. And this was done over a period of 12 months. Uh, so Ken, who was uh, part of our 100K club, uh, recently hit 100K uh, in terms of income, which took him about 15 months to do. And this was effectively through looking at what he already had and then redoing uh, his portfolio. So this is definitely possible for any of you out there that have got properties already, looking at changing the use of them. And if you haven't got them, then now's a good time to start. Uh, this guy here, Phil, he actually filled up all of his properties uh, without anyone setting foot in them. So he did one property, that went really well, and then from then he then had a model. And the great thing about this model uh, and any model that you do really is thinking about systemizing it as much as possible. Because the more you systemize it, the more you can effectively rinse and repeat. And this is effectively what he did. Renting out rooms to students in Bristol for £350 per month, that excludes all bills, which is a really hefty uh, rent to get for all, all bills excluded. Uh, so he has five at the moment, achieving £1,700 per month. Uh, and all he's paying really is mortgage costs on that. Uh, some maintenance, and then just coverage for insurance, etc. Uh, let's have a look at, so we're running out of time, uh, mesmerizing marketing map. So if you're going to go and purchase uh, an HMO and you're going to run it, typically most landlords are going to run it themselves, effectively because uh, there aren't that many agents out there that can manage it for you. Now. We are one of the few agents that do manage HMOs, uh, and we have about 150 at the moment we're managing, but you'll find that in a lot of areas, most people aren't able to find an agent that can manage it effectively for you. So this is why this section in our kind of overall profits principles uh, approach is really key, because most landlords will end up marketing it for themselves. So we call this the mesmerizing marketing map. So you have two ways in which you can do this. The first one is online, the second one is offline. So we're gonna really focus more on the online today and where you could go to basically advertise your properties. So the two places which are getting a lot of traction right now are Facebook and also through online portals. So 
Facebook, lots and lots of traction on there, lots of people that fit in the target demographics looking for rooms, lots of groups such as Rooms to Rent which you can get into, also Marketplace and you can advertise your rooms on Facebook and get a lot of inquiries very, very quickly. Typically, you may get five to ten a day if you're in the right area, sometimes more depending on how many properties you're advertising. And the next one is using online portals. And the biggest online portals you can use are things such as Spare Room and also Easy Roommate. They're the two biggest out there. And just using those free alone, Facebook, Spare Room, Easy Roommate, you pretty much be able to fill most of your properties, particularly when you've got a small number to begin with. It'd be very, very easy to do. Uh, and very, very low cost as well. Uh, accessing, say, Spare Room and Easy Roommate, probably going to be 60, 100 pounds per year. Oh. Uh, shall I go now? <laughs> I hope so. I uh, over the slides a bit, so hopefully. <laughs> uh, I just, I just want to get your opinion though, right? Because marketing is all about imagery and it's all about what people are seeing, right? So just very quickly, here's some live adverts from Spare Room, uh, which is one of the largest portals. So I just want your opinion on this, right? So would anyone like to live in this room? No, it's not the best, is it? So this is a live advert right now, and this is the thing about, if you're gonna go into this market, you don't really have to be exceptional. What you just need to do is offer a product that people actually want, and people are not necessarily really looking for this type of product. You know, this is a tired, outdated product from a landlord who really hasn't spent a lot of time and energy on his rooms. Now, by spending just a little bit of money, you could have something like this, which is a lot cleaner, a lot more like a hotel, and a lot more livable for people just to move into. And again, a lot of this is just about thinking through what it is that the tenant is expecting. And remember, most tenants in this market are kind of like millennials. You know, they're looking for like something that they can add some element of personalization to, but at the same time, they do not want this kind of thing. Similarly, kitchens. Here's a kitchen, live advert right now in spare room. Uh, it's kind of really horrible, if I'm honest. And you've got to think that if this is the only picture of the kitchen, what does the rest of the kitchen look like? Because this is pretty damn horrible. Uh, and again, you can spend not a huge amount of money, but on a kitchen that looks really, really good. And this is kind of like old classic style, but because of this house, this is a Victorian house, I uh, decided to put this particular kitchen in there. You can also use white gloss units as well, which are very, very popular at the moment. But this is just about thinking about when you're advertising something, make sure that you have some kind of imagery in place that makes people interested and excited to actually uh, come and do some business with you, because otherwise it's just not going to work. Uh, you can put adverts in papers. So here's a quick advert. Uh, and there's a ton more stuff in this presentation I'm probably not going to get through because this normally takes a little bit longer. So if anyone does want a copy of the presentation, just come and see me afterwards. We've got some forms to fill out, uh, which look like this. And we can give you a copy of the presentation. Plus also, uh, this is a copy of the parliamentary review that's just come out. Uh, so our sister company, Stanford Knights Letting, uh, has an article in here. Uh, and for any of you in the property sector that are interested in what's going on, this is basically uh, the latest thinking in terms of some of the biggest companies in the UK in terms of what is happening right now, what's going to happen. Uh, it's got a forward in by Theresa May, uh, who I'll be meeting, I think, in a week's time at the House of Commons. Uh, but this whole uh, industry is rapidly changing. And one of the things that we talk about in here is the advent of what I call the multifamily model. Uh, we are in the kind of model right now where it's all very much HMOs, single lets, some social housing, but there's no kind of like congruent joined up thinking. In the US, they've really got behind this in terms of a lot more of a less fragmented approach and it's more cohesive in terms of people working, staying, playing, building communities together, which we think is gonna come. So again, if you want a copy of that, just come and see us at our little store, which we've got outside, and we'll get you a copy of that. Thanks very much for bearing with me. You've been amazing. See you later.